rise of Neoplatonism in North Africa, Greece, and Rome corresponded to a situation existing at that time which has interesting psychological parallels with the present state of our culture. Recognizing that the first five centuries A.D. brought with them the greatest upheaval the ancient world had ever known. It is easy to understand why under the pressure of these stressful centuries men began to reevaluate their spiritual heritage. We recognize the gradual crumbling of the Roman Empire. The most powerful cultural unit that had arisen up to that time. We know that the glory of Greece, which was largely its intellectual and aesthetic glory, this glory had declined, leaving one of the proudest civilizations that we know naked to its enemies, the Romans. We also realize that the great dynastic structure of Egypt had collapsed, first under Greek pharaohs and later under Roman governors. Egypt had lost its leadership in the religious and scientific worlds where it had long been preeminent. All of these heavy circumstances made it inevitable that the average human being should find himself confused, broken away from his old footings and foundations, apparently deserted by his gods, a prey to the selfishness and barbarism of his contemporaries, and with very little refuge against the tremendous storm that was rising in the Mediterranean area. We are much in this condition today, so far as the bankruptcy of our foundation concepts is concerned. Today the uh, average person is drifting, whether he realizes it or not, into a rather dangerous skepticism, a skepticism which he seeks to sustain with scientific concepts. Actually this skepticism, passing generally, for a kindly humanism is attempting to give us certain substitutes for an essential culture. These substitutes are rugged individualism, uh, the rights of man to hew his own destiny out of the mysterious basic materials of space, the idea that each individual must stand alone and must find such consolation as he can in the fulfillment of the life he sees and experiences every day. The drift away from abstraction, from philosophical overtones, this drift is obvious to us all, and it is being intensified by our educational, our scientific, and our economic pressures. In these days, therefore, as Dr. Troinbey has so well pointed out, there is an inevitable division among persons and groups. The larger majority will drift with the prevailing pressures of the time, fighting somewhat but feebly against any strong current that would sweep them along. At the same time, there is a minority that recognizing the essential danger of the time, a danger which success and prosperity and world power cannot conceal from us, recognizing this danger, there are some who are seeking to restore an adequate concept of life. In here, in this case also, we are very close to the Neoplatonists, working with the problem that they faced they realized certain basic weaknesses in the spiritual leadership of religion. We have also recognized 
these weaknesses. We have fought for a long time against what might be termed religious literalism, that is, the acceptance of religious tradition, historical or mythological, as the foundation of spiritual security. The Greeks and the Neoplatonists, looking back upon the great concepts of Greco-Roman religion, found also that their security as individuals uh, was threatened by an inadequate interpretation of spiritual doctrine. So today we are attempting, more or less progressively, uh, to separate religion from the superstitions that have developed around it. But we do not wish to follow the attitude of the materialistic humanist who feels it is perfectly justifiable to burn down the church to get rid of the rat in the basement. Uh, we do not wish to destroy religion in order to save it. We do not wish to take an extreme attitude of casting away all because part is no longer useful. We know that to do this we offend many. That if we turn against religion, we turn against a strong and necessary force operating in the lives of millions of persons. We also realize, whether we like to admit it or not, that we have no ethical substitute, nothing to take the place of religion if we attempt to overthrow its influence. The Neoplatonists felt the same. They realized that their problem was not to destroy religion. Their problem was to rescue religion from the irreligious factors that had crept into its own structure. The first point that they attack, and to a large degree we are focusing attention upon the same basic problem, is what might be termed dogmatic interpretation. They realized that religion was simply more than obeying, more than accepting, more than affirming that a man was good merely because he accepted a prevailing doctrine. Therefore, that the dogmatic use of religious instruments is essentially wrong. The individual should not assume or believe that virtue can be thrust upon him, or that the state of grace can descend upon him merely as the result of obedience to a formula, or to the acceptance or the acceptance of a theological doctrine. Neoplatonism, therefore, recognized the tremendous need for a religious house cleaning that the purpose was to restore the natural faith of mankind, uh, to recognize that this basic power of faith is one of the most positive and constructive forces, possibly the greatest incentive to essential cultural growth that man has ever possessed. Yet this faith has been exploited, not only intentionally but unintentionally. <coughs> it has been subjected to centuries of overlaying with theology and with superstitions and with beliefs that are not an essential part of man's spiritual need. To meet all of these problems, the Alexandrian Neoplatonists sought for what they called a grand key for the restoration of the essential faith of mankind. Many works have been written trying to estimate the effect of Neoplatonism upon its own time and upon subsequent ages. The general consensus of opinion has been that this influence or effect has been tremendous, that it has been far beyond what might be assumed to be reasonable in relation to the comparatively small group of dynamic spirits involved in the school and its comparative brief, comparatively brief existence as an historical entity. Thus, it is assumed perhaps correctly, that Neoplatonism was the training school of Christian theology, that nearly all of your important founding fathers within Christianity were Neoplatonists, that from the disciplines of this school they began to get an insight into the essential difference between religion, per se, and theology. And in their work, they used the instruments, of course, most naturally available to them. Their background was the great religious systems of Greece and Rome, 
We have already gone into some detail concerning the interpretation and the story of the Greek theogony, how the tremendous pantheon of divinities came into existence, and how these divinities were thinly veiled embodiments or personifications of universal forces, principles, and laws operating in the universe. These principles were known to some. They were known to Plato. They were known to Pythagoras and probably to Socrates. They were at least intuitively sensed by Aristotle, although his type of mind was not given as much to abstract speculation as was the mind of Plato. With the exception of a powerful group of leaders, however, it seems that the deeper orphic significance of religion was not too well known to the Grecians. They apperceived to a degree <clears throat> they were initiated in certain rites. They sensed, as we sense, the sublime theology which rested beneath the surface of their fables. But as we have not been able, in 1950 or more years, to grasp the mystical, hyperphysical overtone of Christian revelation, so they were not able to grasp fully the deeper and more moving parts of the Orphic theology. Thus today, uh, modern Christendom, influencing the spiritual destiny of at least a quarter of the population of the earth, is still not able, actually, uh, to put into operation the essential parts of its own teachings. This was true of the Greek religion in general. Christianity looks back upon a small group of illumined mystics and idealists and dynamic human beings who took their faith and accomplished wonders even unto miracles. But this tremendous dynamic has not been generally conveyed to the world. It is not available in the life of the average person as a means of strengthening him against the various weaknesses and intemperances which affect our society. Thus, while we have in Christianity a wonderful metaphysics, we have a tremendous mystical theology. This, while acknowledged, while sensed, while portrayed to us in the great art of Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, these great visionary values have never been able to move masses. They have never been immediately available to the individual in his hour of trouble. This does not mean that Christianity has not enriched him, nor does it mean that millions have not found consolation in their faith. But it does mean that in substance, as in the Greek or Roman world, this faith was never able and has never been able to lead its followers to the final consummation that it sought, world peace, world security, and universal enlightenment. These things have not been accomplished, that yet we all know that essentially they are part of a natural and proper spiritual achievement. We dream of it, we hope for it, we pray for it, but it does not happen. And one of the reasons, of course, why it does not happen is because a sufficient degree of insight has not been conveyed to the believer. The insight has been vested in the faith itself instead of in the hearts of those who seek to follow it. In the Greek mysteries, uh, these great degrees of insight were vested in comparatively small groups of persons who had achieved initiation into the greater mysteries. They possessed an operating key by means of which they could take these principles and put them to work in daily life. The average person lacked this ability. So Neoplatonism, surveying the situation very carefully, came to a conclusion of great profundity and universal unpopularity. And that is that if you want to have this kind of insight, you have to earn it. Now that is one thing that no one has really greatly desired to discover. No one has really wanted to find out that religion was hard work. Now, there is a great deal of difference in hard work between the long, quiet, laborious process of becoming and even the dramatic, dynamic experience of martyrdom. 
It is much easier in many ways to die for a belief than it is to understand that belief. You may also die with tremendous courage, great conviction, and with an absolute dedication, and no one shall doubt the sincerity of the tremendous impulse which has brought with it not only martyrdom, but years of sorrow and burden and humiliation and disgrace. These things we know, but man becoming burdened gains a strange pathos from his burden, becoming embarrassed with the persecutions and sorrows which are heaped upon him, strangely he gains patience without understanding. He gains a certain ability to bear upon a large collective concept, but he does not gain this strange facility to take these experiences and use them as a pointed directive to his own unfoldment and release. Therefore he achieves a certain goodness but it is not a dynamic goodness. It is not the kind of goodness that changes history. It is not the kind of goodness that makes possible the fulfillment of a great spiritual dispensation. The uh, Neoplatonists took this problem directly in hand, and sometime we must likewise do the same. We have to begin to appreciate uh, the tremendous importance of religious education in the sense that it is not merely a believing that is not something that is conferred to us by birth alone, that it is not something that we can receive through the symbolic application of the sacraments, but that spiritual integrity and spiritual enlightenment must arise in the disciplined life of the individual in a kind of consecration which is wonderfully reasonable, wonderfully simple, and constantly penetrating toward the interior parts of beliefs and ideas. Without this, we do not gain the insight which bestows security upon the outer life of the individual. Our present psychological distress throughout the world, with uh, our various phobias and neuroses increasing daily, these are testimonies to the lack of man's internal defense against spiritual ignorance. And without the development of the necessary armament, this ignorance cannot be removed. And someday, if we are not able to demonstrate that our religion has more values than we know, it will become vulnerable to the attacks of humanism, materialism, and other negative forces. Thus, uh, we are now uh, confronted with the problem of seeing how Neoplatonism took hold of the great cycle of classic mythology and attempted to show that it was the, a veiled scientific account of the regeneration of man. That all religion is merely a picturalization, a revelation in form of that which is essentially formless but is a way of life peculiarly significant, peculiarly reasonable, absolutely scientific, and de demonstrable by those who will take the time and effort to fulfill its normal requirements. Neoplatonism uh, took then uh, the strong and de definite stand that religion is not merely a believing. It is a schooling. It is a complete purpose. It is a way of life. It is something that from the cradle to the grave must be cultivated. Cultivated not merely through a series of unfolding acceptances, but cultivated through a series of dynamic adjustments between the individual and the world in which he lives. Although the Neoplatonists are regarded as mystics, they were really um, among the most practical and reasonable of philosophers. For they alone, perhaps, of all schools, emphasize that your attainment is not by learning, but that learning is merely the instrument of becoming. And learning that does not lead toward becoming, does not impel becoming, and does not create within the individual an uncontrollable, uncontrollable enthusiasm to become. If these are not engendered by the natural course of faith, 
then that faith is inadequate, or at least has been inadequately interpreted. Neoplatonism then simply begins with this uh, problem. No man can be saved by what he knows. This is something which uh, perhaps might seem unusual in a philosophical institution. But Neoplatonism sought to break away from this way of measuring things by which a certain smugness and contentment arose from the possession of knowledge that the individual who became knowledge ridden was by this virtue superior this the Neoplatonist opposed bitterly he declared that knowledge unless it led to a purpose which justified its possession was a detriment inasmuch as it led the individual to a false sense of his own achievement. The ignorant man is aware that he is ignorant because he can in no way defend his ignorance, nor can he deny that those around him know more. But a man possessing knowledge without the true key to knowledge has also forgotten that he is ignorant. He has come to the conclusion that the kind of knowledge that he possesses is ultimate, that it is solutional, and that he has solved by knowing. And he is oblivious to the fact that having attained knowledge, as we understand the word, he is still subject to the inevitable vicissitudes of life, and like the most ignorant man, he is still born, still suffers, and still dies and in the midst of his knowledge can put neither his house nor his life in order. This point is of the greatest significance to the Neoplatonist, that a man can know much and still live badly, that the individual can achieve a degree of knowledge insight which may cause him to be publicly applauded, yet at the same time in his private life is lonely, frightened, insufficient, frustrated, unadjusted, that such things can exist, means, of course, only one of two things, namely that knowledge in itself is an illusion, or second, that the individual who believes that he possesses it does not possess it. Neoplatonism assumes the second position, namely that the individual who assumes that he possesses knowledge does not possess it unless this knowledge solves the immediate problems of living. On this grounds, of course, we would find much knowledge vanity, inasmuch as a great part of knowledge today makes no claim to solve personal problems, but perhaps in a large, broad way invites us to assume that ultimately, through knowledge, means may be found to solve large problems. Thus, the actual application is delayed into the future, at a time when the present person will no longer be here to weigh or estimate the consequences. Actually, therefore, Neoplatonism begins by analyzing the nature of knowledge. And this knowledge is recognized as having a certain relationship uh, to final demonstration of itself. In science, certain things must inevitably be demonstrated. And in knowledge, demonstration has been lost, particularly on the religious and philosophical levels. It has been rescued scientifically, and for that reason much philosophy and religion have, has moved onto a scientific basis. But the, the great problem remains that knowledge is merely a kind of skill. Knowledge is to the mind what skill is to the hand. Knowledge is also very largely a development within the sphere of skills. By means of skills we can do certain things. By means of skills we become more able to interpret or to express purposes we have greater proficiency in the finishing and completing of the projects which we undertake. But all of this knowledge skill falls short 
unless with this knowledge is an adequate incentive by means of which we shall employ skill always for the achievement of an end superior to skill. Knowledge, therefore, as an end is illusion. Knowledge as a means to an end has value. But even this is inadequate unless in man the power of volition, the will, binds this knowledge to its purposes resolutely and permanently so that there is never a time or a circumstance in which the individual does not recognize the responsibility for the continuous application of knowledge to its reasonable ends, these reasonable ends being the improvement of self and the improvement of society. Wherever knowledge is allowed to remain unused, it turns upon the person who possesses it and changes him from a truth seeker to an arrogant egotist. The tremendous challenge then of knowledge is the ability to survive the process of learning so that the individual having achieved learning will not have his incentives destroyed by his own achievement and will not sacrifice the vitality of his dynamic capacities in the effort to uh, inform or intellectualize his life. If in Neoplatonism, consequently, uh, we are in the presence of this relationship, we know that these people borrowed all of their symbolism from the great religious systems around them. They were among the first, perhaps, to truly and fully experiment with the concept of a psychological universe, a universe in which every so-called fixed substance or element was merely a symbolic reminder of a dynamic, of a force or factor, itself invisible, but more important than the visible structure which depended from it. The universe of the Neoplatonists, therefore, was not a world of elements or a world of godlings as in the more conservative systems of pagan theology. It was a world of symbols, of processes, of achievements, of attitudes, of relations between things. And in this system, your deities all become embodiments or personifications of attitudes. They become the way we think or feel about something. In this way, we re realize that man lives in a world surrounded by attitude stimuli, and that within himself he possesses an almost infinite field of attitudes which can be stimulated and can be brought to the surface by the various processes of living. The uh, Neoplatonist began to contemplate the divine powers of nature as divine dimensions of his own soul. He recognized a principle which we may basically term uh, reason or rationalized intellect. He assigned this reasonable power to the deity Cronus, assuming that in this ancient father God we have the common emblem of father reason, the root and ground of the rational power, and that from this rational power there suspended another power which uh, can be regarded as the power of Zeus, this power now being uh, intellectualism, which is uh, a demiurgus or semi-ruler, a partial god. And in this mental principle, the Neoplatonists recognized a distinct separateness from the rational principle, even as they recognized the difference between intellectual and intelligible principles. About intellectual principles, thinking is possible. About intelligible principles, rationalization is possible. And the uh, Neoplatonists divided between thought and rationalization. 
The next thing is that they had created a new instrument which they termed the soul or the psychic part of man. They did not devise the term, but they devised its peculiar relationship uh, to the whole pattern. And they placed the soul in the relationship to the external life of man as suspended between the mind and the appetites. The appetites being particularly those phases of elementary uh, function and concept which we associate with the physical requirements of the individual. The psychic life, therefore, was a bridge between body and mind, a bridge across which the individual passed from a state of comparative not knowing to a state of intellectualism. Now, this is not an entirely easy or natural transition to make, but according to the Neoplatonists, this part of man's journey was a collective journey in which the entire motion of society, the cultural life of man, was carrying him along, almost like a ship upon the surface of a heavy current. Um, regardless of what man tries to do, regardless of his indolence or his industry, regardless of his faith or his lack of faith, man is being moved from a physical to an intellectual life. And this is due to his soul, which is a series of pressures within himself by means of which he is unable to remain in any state indefinitely. His soul moves him by fear, uh, by ambition, uh, by uh, the gratification of his sensory desires, by his instincts, and to a measure by his intuitional overtones. The soul, in other words, is the part of man which will never let him remain as he is today. Even though his soul may apparently lead him into ways of error so that he becomes worse, this increase of his ignorance, presumably, is a dynamic chemistry by which the increase of his knowledge is ultimately inevitable. Consequently, regardless of how actively or passively he accepts life, how much he rejects, how numerous his prejudices and his opinions may be, how bigoted his emotions or his mind, the individual is being moved along inevitably by the total pressure of his kind from the state of total ignorance to the state of intellectual integration. In our way of life, which is nearly 2,000 years later than that of this great transitional period, the intellectual life of man has certainly been strengthened. We perceive also the constant activity around him, uh, the pressures that force him more and more to the state of knowing. I was talking not long ago to a young man who is uh, now in one of our technical, technological institutes or learning scientific profession relating to electronics. He explained to me the tremendous increase in the specialization within this field in the last 10 years. That men who were educated 15 years ago in the field now regard themselves as practically obsolete. This young man tells us that it is not only going to be necessary for him to go to school and study for several years yet to come, but that after he graduates, it will probably be necessary for him to spend from three to four months a year in continuous study for the rest of his career to keep up with the incredible progress that is being made in these fields of specialization. This might actually represent uh, the mounting momentum of intellectualism, whereas the mind must become more and more familiar with a greater diversity of specializations in order to keep pace with the discoveries and with the leading intellects of this time. In this process, this young man is going to have relatively little opportunity or time for reflection. He is going to have almost no incentive whatever towards the release of his own life through anything except the job that he holds and the scientific career which he has accepted. If he is able to manage a fairly effective personal life and have a home as good as that of his neighbor, he is going to do about all that can reasonably be expected of him. Yet this young man himself realizes, even though he is caught in this network, that he is going nowhere. He is going nowhere because 
even if he keeps up all that he knows uh, for the rest of his life and goes off into his own quiet grave within 25 years everything that he has learned will probably be largely changed and modified and he departs out of this life with a learning which is not only a very little support to him while he lives but no probable support to him if he has any existence outside of this world whatsoever in fact if he gets to the place where the facts are known his entire education will fall to pieces because he has only been working with the fringe of facts which he full, fully knows he knows that if he worked at, and remained in school all of his time from now till his 70th year he would still be on the, on the fringe of facts this is a rather frustrating situation and it uh, reminds us of the same point that the Neoplatonist was uh, pounding on so desperately namely that somewhere in this situation what we call the intellect has taken over and mistaken the gratification of its own instincts to be living to be purpose and upon the comparison of the lives and characters of persons so dominated we build our concepts of right and wrong of ability and debility of success and failure it does not occur to us as it did to these philosophers nearly 2,000 years ago that perhaps all the world is a failure and that what we are doing is an endless and eternal compromise from which we see no escape and uh, from which we gain little true support in anything that is actually necessary to us with all that we are doing we are not achieving solution with greater knowledge than ever before we live in greater danger than ever before this means that knowledge is not the answer this means that the basic weakness of the theory principle concept of knowledge has never been adequately corrected Neoplatonism says there is only one way of achieving this correction and that is by a series of steps the first of which is the elevation of man from the state of intellectualism to the state of rationality now rationality uh, is considerably higher than mind even as mind is higher than appetite and as an individual in our world realizes gradually through his mind that through the continuous gratification of his appetites alone he can destroy his economic life destroy his health and destroy his social adjustment and therefore he imposes reluctantly but nevertheless resolutely certain restraints upon his own personal appetites failing to do so he must expect the punishments and penalties of excess this he realizes and he tries at least half-heartedly uh, to protect his own survival by bringing the mind to bear upon the problems of his impulses and instincts the Plotinus tells us that in the same way the survival of the intellectual creature depends upon the rational discipline that the individual cannot do anything that he thinks to do that he cannot depend upon his thoughts as the absolute and proper guides and rules of his life he cannot follow his mind any more than he follows his appetites nor can he regard a well-filled mind uh, as being any more protective of his ultimate security than a well-filled stomach both may have their proper places but neither the filled mind nor the filled stomach guarantee a happy person both of these factors are subject to rationalization and rationalization is the placing of the total life under the over concept of the reasonable in nature man may not know always that which is true but he does perceive at least dimly that which is reasonable and he discovers frequently that the reasonable is in conflict with the desirable in the sense of his ordinary level of thoughts emotions and desires consequently the development of a rational life 
impels the individual toward the accomplishment of rational instruments for he will never be rational simply by desiring to be the desire he must have but this desire like many desires in life will mean nothing unless it mainsprings a dynamic determination to achieve this end which is desirable. So Plotinus tells us that the development of man depends upon a series of natural disciplines imposed by society to a certain point, this being the discipline which brings with it ultimate intellectual integration. Then self-imposed disciplines which must always be present where the individual desires to transcend the common policy of his time. The moment the individual wishes to be better than those around him, and I do not mean this arrogantly, but in a sincere and natural desire to improve, if he wishes to live better than his times, better than his environment, or better than that standard which is defended by litigation or legation around him. In order to achieve this better standard, it is necessary for him to impose discipline upon himself. There is no one else to do it. And to achieve this end without falling under some fanaticism or some theological discipline which may or may not be suitable or necessary. He must begin the process of self-government. The rational person must begin to live according to the dictates of reason. And reason in this case is much more than thought. Reason is a combination of thought projected through experience toward vision and insight. Reason, then, is actually man's determination from the known, that which is next or remains partly known. It is the thing which causes us today to plan for the future. It is that dimension which indicates to us an achievement yet to be made. And to achieve this, to do that which has not been done, to remain true without the defense and support of society. All this requires a peculiar kind of dedication. The individual may or may not feel the importance of this dedication in terms of immediate utilities. Therefore, he is impelled to it also by considerations larger than those of his daily life. Religion gives him such uh, motivations by reminding him of his moral duties, by reminding him of the divine will and the divine plan for man. And the religious person is impelled toward the cultivation of a high, higher moral or ethical life by the principles of his faith which will offer him certain inducements, among these inducements being the protection and presence of divine favor if he abides by those divine laws which transcend his normal instincts or desires. This may in itself be useful, but here he is again trusting his nature uh, to a pressure which Plotinus does not primarily advocate he can see why and how the religious person might have more inducements uh, to become rational than other persons. But this is not his answer uh, to this problem. The problem of rationality depends for Plotinus upon the Platonic universe, upon the great theological system of the Greeks, namely, actually, that the universe, the gods, creation. All things come to age in man. Man is therefore the hope of ages. Man is the peculiar embodiment personification of the entire universal rationality. 
that peculiar power which we call human reason can never be perfected apart from man. This human reason is a phase or form of divine reason. And that kind of divine reason which lies at the root of man can never manifest itself except through man. Consequently, man's growth is God's unfolding. Man's achievement is God's release. Man's attunement to universals is consequently his natural opportunity, his universal responsibility, and his most personal and immediate obligation. All other things are second to man's actual acceptance of the purpose for which he was created, that purpose being that universal reason shall come of age in him. If he fails in this purpose, all other achievements are as nothing. If, however, through a complete and perfect dedication to this pur purpose, presuming such is possible, man through the attainment of this purpose attains with it all other things that are necessary to him. The individual, therefore, who becomes to, truly and totally an instrument of the rational principle in this achievement attains the total integration of himself. There is from that time on no impulse, instinct, or incentive in him to perform such actions as may have detrimental consequences to himself or others. Nor is there any inducement by which he can be moved away from equilibrium into some excess which may be painful to himself or dangerous to others. Thus the person established in rationality is established upon an immovable foundation, a foundation which prohibits and forbids that he shall ever be a menace, a danger, or a hazard to himself or others. The uh, achievement of such a state may naturally and inevitably be regarded as desirable, but with most persons they hope that someone else will get to the position where they will be too wise to injure each other and that the individual involved can continue in his own ways. It is very hard for man to contemplate the arduous procedure of truly rational development. Yet Plotinus also tells us uh, that this peculiar arduousness with which we have bound the concept and by which we have made discipline the antonym of our own desires, that this entire concept is an illusion, is error. That actually it is far more difficult for us to be unintelligent than it is for us to be illumined. That it is far more arduous for us to strive to continue an inadequate state than it is to relax and permit ourselves to move into adequacy that actually the natural motion of existence is the one motion which we can accept without pressure, without hazard, and without conflict. Wherever we are out of tune or out of harmony with universal motion, we are in pain or in sorrow or in stress. Our present state is a proof of non-alignment between man and his own purpose. And the moment man moves into alignment, all friction, all tension or stress, detrimental to his peace of mind and peace of soul, correspondingly diminish with the degree of his adjustment. So Plotinus points out the importance of the rational way of approaching life. Then he takes the great expanded universe of the Greeks, the Gnostics, and the Egyptians, and shows that this universe is a kind of luminous sphere of adjustments by means of which the individual ascends this ladder of the stars by a series of attainments within himself. That the universe is in reality levels and degrees of consciousness and that man moves through these levels and that as he ascends 
he comes into spheres more compatible than those he leaves behind and that the natural ascent of man or the return of the traveler to his own home is simply the restoration of universality in the consciousness of the individual by a series of disciplines which are referred to by the Neoplatonists as theurgical or the use of the divine magic. This divine magic is the mysterious, God-given, miraculous faculty in man. It is the fulfillment of the concept which has been held by most religious and philosophical systems without perhaps complete rationalization, namely that there is a power resident in man by means of which all things are possible. And that this power by which all things can be made possible or can be regarded as possible has only one possible nature and that is that it is all nature, that it is the only power in which all things are possible, and that is the divine power itself. Thus, because man possesses a participation in a natural birthright of divine energy, by this reason man can attain anything possible to man, and those things possible to man include man's final complete liberation and re-identification with God. Such achievement is not only possible but archetypally inevitable. And the great sorrow of man is his struggle against inevitable good. This is his burden and the terrible problem which he has never been able to solve to his own satisfaction or to the comfort and convenience of those around him. Theurgical discipline begins with the gradual reduction of the quotient of error in the conduct of the individual. As the uh, Greek mysteries pointed out, let no man say he is good who does not act in conformity with the good. This idea that we have that an individual is good in spite of his mistakes, that he is good although his actions are not good. This concept is erroneous. Also, that an individual whose concepts are good and whose actions are relatively good should be satisfied to continue upon this level of relative good continuously throughout life. This also is not good. Therefore, even attained goodness is in constant mutation. And the individual who in one day has not more of goodness than he possessed the day before is himself failing in some respect. It is not possible to establish a code of good and live by it from the cradle to the grave. Good is an unfolding degree of insight. And growth requires that this growth unfoldment should be continuous. And that each individual surmounts the past with each new day, rising victoriously now over all the yesterdays that went before. The continuance or pushing of error from today into tomorrow, without change of its quality or nature, cannot be considered to be natural growth, nor can it lead to natural growth. Neoplatonism was not a greatly favored belief simply because it tied religion, philosophy, and science to a process of continuous becoming through disciplined action. A kind of discipline, however, that is almost Zen-like. And there is much in these early Greek and Roman philosophies to indicate Asiatic contact. Because, like Zen, Neoplatonism moved in a kind of mystery. It moved in the mystery of man's relaxing into good. It moved in the mystery of a discipline uh, by which the person achieved all good by gradually separating his consciousness from that which was not good. Not through the victory by self-effort of man over every frailty of his own flesh, but the ability 
to transcend certain attitudes and move into others. And by the changing of one attitude, changing a hundred habits all at once. That is uh, the uh, difference between Platonism and Aristotelianism primarily. Aristotle, when he went after something, tried to get the bug off of every leaf. He was going to save the tree a leaf at a time. Plato took the attitude that if you gave the tree good food in the roots, the chances are the tree would be strong enough to get rid of the bugs. And that just as surely as the reasonable represents Cronus, so beyond the reasonable is the mysterious power of the good, which is Uranus or Eurydice, the mysterious god who was sacrificed and immolated in order that Cronus might come to his throne. Therefore, beyond reason is heaven, which was the symbol that Uranus represented, the great vistered bowl of the sky, star spangled with a hundred million worlds. This was beyond reason. It was beyond the reasonable man to comprehend. Yet that which is beyond reason, that which is beyond thought, that which is beyond daily and constant experience of man, can this in any way be known? Can that which is beyond knowledge be known? Can that which transcends any faculty or power of our common experience be in itself known? Plotinus thought that it could be known in a way. It could be known to man by means of an impact. Man looking up to the sky does not know the sky, but he wonders upon it and about it. And if he is a poet, he may feel a tremendous emotional surge from the majesty and mystery of this vast empyrean around him. To him the sky carries certain overtones, vastness, universality, profundity, mystery, majesty, sublimity. All these things moving in upon the individual result in the development or integration of a superior group of faculties. These faculties have to do with what the old physiognomists and uh, phrenologists referred to as the faculties of sublimity. And sublimity is the impact of universals. Sublimity is this mysterious power which is ignored by the foolish who can walk under the bowl of heaven for the cr from the cradle to the grave and find nothing in the sky above them except space and a few wandering stars. <coughs> Sublimity, however, is something uh, that reaches those in whose hearts and minds there is not only intellectual power, but a certain strange romancing instinct. Sublimity is for poets, for mystics. But poets, as we realize, are the prophets of races, that upon their early labors, more sober men later carve the mausoleums of people. For it is the poet who gives birth, it is the philosopher who buries the races of the earth. This concept has to uh, Plotinus a, a great importance, namely that man can receive into his own nature something that is immeasurable. Yet in its immeasurableness has that quality in it, which cutting through intellect and emotion, brings a common amazement to the child and the sage, an amazement which is the natural gift of the small child and the cultivated gift of the aged man, something that we outgrow in a funny way uh, by becoming less than we were before. The child looks out upon the universe as the great adventure, mature man as the great disillusionment. 
And yet beyond this there must be something else. The child is righter than the man. Because the man has built a grave for himself in a universe in which there is no death. These kind of thoughts move Plotinus to the state or to the concept that there is above reason man's power to apperceive the simple substance of the good. Now the good is a term which to us means very little. Almost anything we like is good. Almost anything we do not like is not good. We throw it in uh, conflict to bad, meaning pleasant and unpleasant for the most part. But to Plotinus there was a sovereignty of good of itself. And good is in some way one of the most profound experiences of which man is capable. Good is beyond reason. Good is something which reason may aspire to. Good is something without which practically every noble sentiment of man would perish. For all who labor sincerely, honorably, earnestly, labor toward the good, for the good, or in the spirit of goodness. Yet none can define this very substance of their own endeavor. The good, therefore, to Plotinus, was a kind of enduring archetypal principle that transcended even heaven, that transcended everything that we know, but of which heaven itself, with its infinite majesty, in the profundities of, the profundities of which all inadequacy seemed to be lost and buried, that vastness which man can explore from its various dimensions and find nothing bad, this something which is unutterable to Plotinus awakened, stimulated or inspired, released or revealed in man himself a mood, a kind of nature, a reaching outness, a capacity for the experience of sublimity. And Plotinus declared that this capacity was the ever-flowing fountain of the good. So behind rationality, we discover that the only purpose for reason is to discover the good. The only purpose for virtue is to live according to the good. The only purpose of beauty is that it shall reveal the dimensions of the good. The only purpose of happiness is that it shall cause us to experience a sensation of the good within our own nature. Therefore, instead of seeking to be happy primarily, man experiences happiness ultimately only to the degree that it is founded in good, that it produces consequences from itself which can never be contrary to the pleasure which we cultivate. Plotinus then said, how shall we experience or know this nature of the good? How shall we experience pure good? as apart from its conditioned aspects, its negative expressions in our daily living. He realized that there is only one possible way that man can ever grasp or control or come to att attunement with universals. And that is through a series of living instruments he would have had no faith in the telescope and no faith in the microscope to accomplish more uh, than to reveal to man other phases of a, na of a nature which extends in many directions, but which is always on a kind of level. Plotinus believed that only living instruments would be capable of achieving unity or experience within living forces. That these things cannot be communicated, they cannot be passed on as a priceless heritage, they do not need to be perpetuated by men because they are self-perpetuating. 
if there was not a good man for a million years, goodness would not die. For the first good man who was born after that time would embody it again. That this goodness has a total existence in itself, but that its expression upon any level of function depends upon instruments upon that level. He therefore held that goodness is a sovereign principle in itself and that those who approach it become like it. Those who become like it become uh, endowed with its attributes and become capable of expressing these attributes in their own lives. Thus, growth is an approaching. It is man coming nearer and nearer to a substance. And to achieve this nearness, he is constantly required to become like this substance. For he cannot approach anything from which he is divided by difference. Therefore, he approaches by similarity and remains aloof by difference. Thus, only the good can know the good. Thus only the good can experience the good. And regardless of what we think or believe, each individual is continuously experienced the good as he is, sharing in that part of the good which he has attained by his own moral and ethical existence. But beyond his experience, he can approach the good only by the gradual extension through discipline of his own nature toward goodness and toward the gradual elimination of interval by eliminating qualitative difference. This is the same concept that lies behind the principle of yoga. For in the highest phase of Hatha yoga, uh, Raja Yoga, we are confronted with the great problem of similitude. We mentioned in the last lecture the discussion of sympathies between gods and men, as held by the Greeks. Uh, the Neoplatonists held this sympathy to be true, a kind of fact, namely, that nothing similar can be divided, and nothing dissimilar can be united. Therefore, all things seeking reality must become themselves real. All things desiring union with peace must of themselves become peace. Those things desiring to become united with wisdom must achieve this union by becoming themselves wisdom. Buddha points out, of course, the importance of not saying, in this instance, that they shall become wise. Uh, Buddha said we should not say that to approach wisdom we must become wise. He would say with the Neoplatonists that to approach wisdom we must become wisdom. Because to become wise assumes that we are to attain a state within ourselves that has a separateness from the goal that we seek. The wise man, in a strange way, defeats the concept of wisdom because he represents an achievement separate from a total existence. Whereas in reality what we call a wise man, if we may refer to such, is merely a man in whom wisdom is apparent. It is not that he is wise, but that he has become susceptible of existing in a state of wisdom. For wisdom is not of himself. Wisdom is of the good. It is therefore man's possibility to express wisdom, but it is never of his possibility to possess it. He moves into adjustments with something having an eternal subsistence in eternity. And this subsistence is the wisdom principle itself, or the principle of good in itself. Beyond wisdom, beyond goodness, beyond sublimity, 
Plotinus apexed his tremendous uh, concept of mystical theology by his creation of the, sin, of the sign or symbol of ultimate. And that is what he called the alone. The alone is that by which nothing else is comparable. The alone is that in which there can be no nature but itself. That which is alone means that which is strangely and wonderfully and totally unique. And in you being totally unique, it depends upon its unique totality. The alone, which is the end of all, is that which re rests forever, alone because it can never be known by anything except itself. It is the uniquely misunderstood. It is that reality of which we all feel we have a sovereign participation because there is scarcely a person who does not inwardly feel to be alone because of a uniqueness in himself by which he declares that all others understand him only in part. Thus this negative phase of uniqueness, loneliness, is the absolute opposite of the alone. That which is separated from the alone is lonely. That which achieves union with the alone is alone. And the difference between the lonely and the alone is something that uh, even on our little narrow theater of activity we can perhaps give some concept to. Because there are people who by circumstances or necessity uh, live solitary lives. Some of these people are lonely. Others are alone. And even in our own experience there is a vital difference between these two things. The lonely individual is one who longs for an association or a reunion with things. But that person who is alone may have the strange, deep strength of his own aloneness. The lonely person is weak. The person alone may be very, very strong. There is a difference here. A difference of psychological interpretation of one mystical fact. If aloneness represents the individual deprived of association, then he is lonely. But if aloneness means that the individual has found union with a uniqueness within himself, by means of which he has been reunited with this principle of solitary sublimity, then he is not lonely but he is again alone. For of all things, as Plotinus tells us, that which is most alone is God. For God, strangely as it may seem, though in everything and of everything, governing all things out of the majesty of its own power, present in various attributes and aspects in everything that exists, yet God is completely alone. And the reason why this is true is that it's all the divine flame or spark in the life of every creature is unknowable to every other creature and unknown by that creature itself. Therefore, it remains completely isolated, completely alone. The last thing that any man will ever know is the God in himself. Therefore, the deity, though ever-present, remains the most distant, remains the most completely separate from all things. Uh, Plotinus, following Diogenes of Sinopus, also explains to us that this alone, this state of alone, is possible only to that which is primary. Nothing which is dependent upon anything can be alone but can be lonely. To be alone 
and to survive means that that being or creature must be the source of everything necessary to itself and the fulfillment of every need which it may experience. It must be its own source of life. It must be its own source of generation, propagation, and creation. And that which creates, propagates, or generates must be itself. So in the one alone, we have also the absolutely supernal attribute of the divine, namely that it depends upon nothing. Yet this power dependent upon nothing gains from the mystic a strange sympathy. This power which man does not recognize as alone but is rather inclined to regard as as lonely as the human heart. Man seeking to comfort God, seeking to take away from himself and his deity this sense of isolation, affirms and assumes that he is necessary to this God and that this God is necessary to him and that therefore neither can be alone. The mystic, however, is moving only within the sphere of his own experience. Actually, his need is eternal, but the need of the one which is alone, he cannot know, nor can he even attempt uh, to speculate about it. So in the Neoplatonic and in the Greek mysteries, the universe is divided into two things, that which is alone and that which is lonely. And the great journey of life, as Proclus tells us, is the journey of the lonely to that which is alone. It is the journey, therefore, away from separateness, by which a loneliness is implied, lostness, as in the story of the prodigal son, or in the wandering sheep. The return of that which is lonely, is without consolation, is disconsolate in its own soul, the return of that to the splendid mystery of that which is alone and never weak. These contemplations all point to the upper structure of Neoplatonic theology. They point out that all rational contemplation all inspirational, intuitional, illuminal contemplation of the principle of the rational and the principle of the good, that all of this leads to a final higher mysticism and impels us to include Neoplatonism among the great systems of revelational knowledge. For in Neoplatonism it becomes increasingly obvious that the higher steps of the discipline depend upon a curious rapport between the alone and the lonely heart. That man in some mysterious way finds in his loneliness some clue to the aloneness of the eternal. And he discovers also that out of his own loneliness comes the strange mystery of his own strength. That it is in his loneliness that he transcends himself. That it is in this loneliness that the false consolations of an illusional existence fall away. That in loneliness man must face himself, must experience uh, the needs of his own inner life and his, alo his loneliness tells him of the emptiness of his own core. It tells him that he is without center. Therefore, that his longings, his yearnings, his strange negative sighings after something, all these pressures reveal to him uh, the, his own essential weakness that uh, he cannot endure himself that he cannot survive himself that he is 
completely lost. He has not achieved that wonderful state of the French essayist who on one occasion coined that beautiful statement, never less alone than when alone. This difference uh, is the motion toward the inner life. This is the motion which causes man gradually to orient in a sphere of transcendental values. It causes him to realize, first of all, that he can go through all of the so-called achievements of man and still remain lonely. And this loneliness is the hunger after eternity, as Bimi calls it the hunger for the eternal in man. It is the thing which probably symbolically gave rise to such stories of the prodigal son returning to his father's house or the Gnostic hymn of the robe of glory. Here we have the wanderer struggling through a strange and desolate region sustained only by the half-remembered vision of a better distant place. Here we have Parsival, the knight of the grail, who had been cast out of the castle because he was a young and guileless fool, who was not apparently able to understand, but ever having seen the strange sacrament of the grail, he devoted his life to the long, distant, difficult wanderings to find again the castle which first he had not appreciated or understood. And at last, in black armor and visored and helmed, he is seen on Good Friday returning up the narrow pathway that leads back to the castle of the Grail. And it here that Gurnemans, the great uh, retainer knight, sings the wonderful story the tells of this youth coming back, searching for a lifetime to find the mysterious temple on the mountains which he had seen as a boy, which had then been meaningless, but which he had never been able to forget. And in man, this never forgetting, this ever to remember, this peculiar psychological experience of an, of an endless loneliness that can only terminate in God. Plotinus said this instinct is there. It is an instinct so strong that this is the great instinct. This is the great pressure which moves all human beings. Whether recognized, unrecognized, served or not served, every human being is lonely until it is returned to the alone. Disciplines, therefore, begin to take on a rather quiet, almost note of pathos. They are this gentle seeking after a very gentle mystery. For this mystery is never going to be spectacular. It is never man conquering space or riding out on some strange cosmic conveyance into the distant places of immeasurable time and eternity. It is the pilgrim going home. Home out beyond the stars or within the stars and everywhere. And that this true one alone that waits is everywhere, in everything, covered and crossed by this distance of man moving from loneliness toward that which is alone, which he discovers its nature by his own privation, so that he comes to discover deity as something which has about it a quality of ageless yearning, something uh, that was undoubtedly far beyond the concepts of that time, but it was a very deep and noble concept uh, toward which Plotinus tried to inspire his students and disciples. Thus the universe became the sphere of these great desires. Gods and planets and angels were only the embodiments of these moods, these tremendous pressures of things, 
and growth was the systematic ascent of the orbit of the seven stars. It was man moving through the universe and in this motion discovering the gods, uniting with them, carrying them on also, but discovering everywhere only one thing, a universe lonely for its maker. And of course, by natural assumption, assuming in some way that this maker was like the father of the prodigal son, who in his quietude and in his waiting, waited for his son to come back. It might have been a little sentimental in that department, but still it conveyed a, a sense of values. It moved life entirely away from brilliance of achievement uh, to homely things, to the homely love of father and child and the uh, homely desire of the wandering and lost child to find the security of the father's house. So Plotinus uh, invited the students that he had uh, to consider this journey as the principal course of their lives, that they should return again to the golden age from which they had come, to the shadowy mystery from which they had been born, and to strive valiantly to find the alone which is at the root of all things. Now, this brings us to another important separa a separating thought, and that is Plotinus applying his concepts to such attributes as space and time came to a very interesting combination of definitions. To him, space is man's symbol of the alone. And by the same analogy, time is man's symbol of loneliness. Time and space, therefore, are loneliness and the alone. Time is the measure of the great journey of the home seeker. Time is something that is forever separating man. At the same time, impelling him or moving him according to the vast pageantries of space. Space, therefore, being the alone, is the only self-sufficient form of existence. Space is in itself and of itself unique and complete. Space is infinite potential. It is all fullness. It is inscrutability. It is that in which there can be no hunger and no thirst. It is that from which nothing can be derived uh, other than within its own nature. So space is an alone that is never lonely because being all it is never separate it never exists in relation to anything else because its totality is unique within itself time however is a measure of events the measure of a struggle in which from the cradle to the grave and by the great cycles of rebirth in nature man is forever measuring his separateness and striving to overcome it. So striving and time, peace and space, have become synonymous. Now Plotinus said, therefore, in the, his great interpretation of the theology, that man, trying to become like space, or like eternity, as differentiated from his time obsessions, must discover that there is only one way of being alone without being lonely, and that is to be complete. Completeness can leave no loneliness, because in completeness there is no yearning of divided parts. In completeness, there can be no deficiency or separateness by which the experience of loneliness is possible. The number one, for example, 
stands for the first. It also stands for the all. It stands for the totality. One is the unique number. Therefore, one is the one alone. But the one is not lonely because from it moves the progeny of number. From it unfolds the whole mystery of diversity. Yet this number itself is unique and alone to the end. By this aloneness it is supreme. It is the number of numbers, uh, the golden number. That which is the symbol of absolute truth, absolute good, absolute reality. Yet when we think of this one standing alone, we must never think of it other than as all. For in this allness of it, it absorbs loneliness. Because loneliness is privation. It is the deficiency of something within the nature of beings. And there can be no deficiency in the presence of totality. How then, says Plotinus, shall we make this an operating fact in our own daily life? First of all, we must contemplate for our own daily use on a very simple level to begin with, always remembering, however, that these levels extend archetypally and that to achieve on one level is to symbolically state achievement on all levels. And that the individual who masters a principle upon one level has gained an insight which will enable him to adjust to other levels. Therefore, any actual accomplishment of a true attainment becomes a universal key to attainment. For all attainments are of one essential nature though they may differ in degrees and magnitudes. In our daily conscious functioning, therefore, the difference between aloofness or isolation and integration may be the way in which we approach the difference between loneliness and aloneness. Aloneness, first of all, rises from the recognition that man's supreme strength lies internal. That the alone in him is alone capable of victory. That the alone in him gives him the sovereign right to be himself at all times, under all conditions, in all pressures, and in all circumstances. Each man is unique. Therefore, it is utterly unnecessary for him to take on the superstitions, the doubts, the fears, or the emergencies of others. He may be sympathetic to them. He may strive to assist them. But in any way in which they fall short, it is not necessary that he copies them, that he be like them, or that he depend upon them for the fulfillment of values that can arise only within his own nature. Man's aloneness in its internal uniqueness makes man superior to time and place, makes him superior to the dogma of a hundred cults, makes him superior to all laws known to man, and at the same time makes him superior to any action contrary to that which is right or reasonable. Therefore, the man who is superior to law is not the lawbreaker. The individual who never breaks the law is superior to the law. The individual who never becomes involved in that which is less needs, therefore, not to pass through certain circumstances through which we commonly pass in our daily living. Now we do not expect, and Plotinus did not expect, that anyone would live by so grandose an abstraction in a single uh, magnificent gesture. 
he recommended a series of gentle, slow processes of exploration and experimentation within the self. Realizing that our weakness is in the sense of our isolation and our strength is the sense of belonging. That the individual feels greater courage when he is with others or is with the power of a superior force. Then the individual should realize that his supreme strength is when he is with the core of his own purposes. That in every case his orientation means that he shall be in the center of himself. That his orientation means that he shall in himself find that refuge which he is forever seeking elsewhere. Plotinus recommends that men recover from the illusion that anything anywhere, any time, can make them happy. And also from the equally serious delusion that anything, anywhere, any time, can make them unhappy. Unhappiness or happiness depends upon man's internal understanding of the difference between loneliness and aloneness. The lonely must always be unhappy. The alone is never unhappy. That which is, uh, which is lonely is yearning for the communion with value. The alone is that value. Therefore, each person consists of a group of members, attitudes, emotions, and the seven, eightfold cycle of his own soul. Having within his nature many lonely beings, depending upon the alone in him for their security. The mind, the emotions, all of the instincts, appetites, and attitudes of the individual depend for their validity and for their integrity upon the basic strength of the core person. Your whole life, as the lives of those around you, is to a measure involved in the core strength of yourself. Plotinus did not believe, materialistically speaking, that a person's own ego is that core, or that this individual must depend totally upon his own isolated efforts. To Plotinus, this alone, this core, is God, the supreme power. But experienced and known only, through the personal experience of the individual moving and moved by his longings and his yearnings and his aloneness toward this union with value. So that wherever the emergency arises in our own thinking that we seek this core point and in seeking it we achieve it in only one way. And that is, as Plotinus points out, by a disciplined means of letting go of error. The Platonic theology, later the Neoplatonic, therefore again states the point that we have made so many times, that it all bases from one simple concept that we have in the scriptures, namely, be still and know that I am God. Through stillness, through this mysterious power to retire, to by making this wonderful night journey of the soul, man attains the incredible and yet inevitable end, namely that he can retire into the complete uniqueness of himself and rest there upon the wind of ages that he becomes by this very virtue immovable in virtue, that he becomes in this way so filled with the grace of the alone that he is incapable of a destructive or evil action, that he is also incapable again of experiencing disorientation, 
And today our great problem is disorientation. And most disorientation is one form or another of fear. And most fear in human life depends upon this peculiar sense of loneliness. Loneliness is the root of fear. It is the strange sense of being orphaned from space. Loneliness is insecurity. It is confusion. It is the individual like the small child wandering about in a sea of stars, all strangely distant and mysterious. Loneliness is man living in a world of matter and looking around him and finding nothing but forms and never their souls. Loneliness is a human heart in a mechanistic universe. Loneliness is man's natural love of good in an unmoral universe. A universe he has created out of his own attitude toward life. It is also man's disorientation and fear and aloneness in his faith if he kneels on his knees and prays to a god of anger. A god in some mysterious way to whom he cannot go home as a little child with simple faith and hope. So the moment his God is a God of battles, he is alone. And he is lonely because his own heart is not a heart of battles. The moment this deity becomes vast, great, impressive, majestic, regal, then this little loneliness comes back because man does not expect to find understanding in the court of emperors whether it be the emperor of the universe or anything else this Lao Tzu very beautifully points out in his strange mystic Chinese verses man seeking for this which is alone is therefore never seeking the splendid he is never seeking that which is tremendous he is seeking that which is infinitely sensitive, that which in some mysterious way he can approach face on, something to which he does not grovel, something that he goes back to in a strange sense of total equality, something that he recognizes is too big to belittle him, too, uh, too truly parental, that it is possible that that which is alone should not understand his loneliness. Thus this process, as Plotinus points out, is the process of simplicity in the night. It is something that is per forever available, something that reaches out as we reach out. It is something very simple, known perhaps to furred things in the forest or bird upon the wing. For as one of the Greeks said, the bird lives and dies alone. The animal lives and dies alone. Is it lonely? That we do not know, because it is possible that it is only our own minds and the peculiar complex of our human genius that makes it possible for us to be lonely. It is quite possible that to these things that have much less of security than we will ever know, the mother bird guarding her eggs in a world of enemies with no one to protect, no skill to build with, and no knowledge as we know to protect with, only some strange instinct an instinct to live or die with that nest and that nest the universe and the whole universe bound into the sovereignty of this simple task is that bird ever alone that we do not know but we have strange mysterious suspicion that it is not and perhaps more than we lives always in the presence of that which is alone 
sharing it, sharing its strange strength and free of the dependency which comes from ignorance. So our aloneness is something that we can experiment with to discover the strange strength of it and that as we make use of this strength we have a new dimension and experience of God. The God of the alone. The God that comes alone to the alone. That which is utterly independent of priest or presbyter. That which is only available as the immediate experience of consciousness. It is evident that this type of thinking left Neoplatonism a frail little group of persons in a world that did not even know the meaning of the things that he taught. But through the passing of centuries, the world has become a little more lonely and a little more tired, and perhaps therefore a little more capable of understanding the true mystery of life, which is this journey toward the peculiar and wonderful security of identity with that which is simple and alone, that which is our strength, that which is our endless source of life and courage. Now this whole concept and everything that relates to it and far more than we can possibly mention arose from the Greek theology. It was the final flowering, the sad, gentle flowering that followed the mystery of the age of Pericles, the golden age had passed away and was a shadow. Men had fallen into aloneness and loneliness both. The gods had returned to high Olympus. The saints no longer walked the earth. The sages had departed. And humanity, lonely for happiness, lonely for truth, lonely for love, reached out across the mystery, mysterious void left by the departure of the gods and began to, to, to muse, to contemplate, and finally came to the understanding that religion had never changed at all, that the gods had not departed, that nothing had actually changed except that man had become afraid, had become tired, and in his fear and tiredness had dissolved the golden age. That in the place of it he lived in an age of iron, an age of fear, an age of, of loneliness because he could no longer see the gods, could no longer know them immediately because he saw more clearly the hatreds of his fellow men. Plotinus was convinced the great theology never changed. That 10,000 years ago or 10,000 years into the future, the relation of man and divinity would be the same, unchanging forever. And that the great process of human growth would always be the same, this motion of the lonely heart to union with the aloneness that is strength that in this motion man discovered again all the glories of the heavens, all the wonders of the angels, all the mysteries that had been locked from the day of creation. For he discovered it simply through his own gentle adjustment with it. And his gentle growth, his quiet, kindly search as the child seeking to be understood, in this way man learns to understand. Plotinus tells us this story, tries to help us to understand it, and leaves it to us as his heritage. And I think beyond any question of doubt, it is the noblest heritage of the Golden Age. It is the heritage that consummated a wonderful era of glory and religion, glory that led to darkness, that but left behind it the brooding and mooning strength of this great and mysterious power abiding forever, waiting and hoping, and this vast circumference of growing things longing to go home, 
longing to be one with that power. Call it escape if you will. But to him, it was the symbol of the natural, inevitable purpose of life. Namely, that man should seek understanding and love and seek it only where it is, that is, in the universal consciousness of God.